Hi there, and welcome to our WSET Bite Size webinar on Grappa. Um, just for those of you who might not know, uh, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust is a leading uh, provider of qualifications in wine, spirits, and sake, and soon beer. Um, so uh, you can uh, find our courses in a huge number of different countries, so 70 countries, and we've got over 800 course providers. Um, so let's get started then. So what is grappa? Well, to start with, it's a drink. Right, so uh, that's, that's fine then. Um, well, seriously, it's a fragrant Italian spirit uh, made with pomace. All right, so where does it, it originate in Italy? Okay, uh, it has to be, for, to be grappa, it needs to come from Italy. Uh, but our records sort of indicate that it originates in Northern Italy, uh, near the Alps, uh, in the sort of Trentino, Alto DJ and Val d'Aosta area. Um, but, uh, and those records date back to about the 14th century, so for a very long time. Um, but now it's made all over Italy. Um, it originated as a very early form of upcycling waste from winemaking. Okay. Uh, what people discovered was there's an awful lot of alcohol uh, still available in the, what's left over after making wine. And rather than waste that, why not distill it? So let's talk about what grappa is made from. So the raw material here is pumice. So pumice is the solid remains of grapes after they've been pressed for wine. So we're talking about the skins, the pulp, the seeds, and the stalks. Um, and uh, you can make, uh, you can have both white and black grape pumice. Um, and you know, that would come from both white wine making and red wine making. Uh, we can also have specific grape varieties uh, that will give their own aroma. So pumice normally has this sort of stalky, floral, uh, herbal kind of aroma anyway. Uh, but if you are using an aromatic variety like Gewürztraminer or Muscat, uh, we'll get some of those uh, aromas coming through as well. Just something to note, which I didn't mention before, is if you have any questions, please feel free to ask those questions in the Q&A uh, ribbon at the, I think it's at the bottom of your screen probably, um, and I will try and answer them as I go, but I might also answer them at the end of the session. We've got an awful lot to cover, in about 20 minutes. So I'm going to try and crack on, uh, but there should be loads and loads of time at the end to answer any questions we might have. All right, so how do you make pumice or how do you get pumice? Well, it's different depending on whether we're making white wine or red wine. So if we're making pumice from white grapes, we're gonna start off with our grapes and we're going to crush and press them. And the outcome of that is grape juice. If we were making wine, we'd then add some yeast and we'd let that ferment. And essentially we would be, we would have some white wine there. But in this case, we're not actually interested in that wine. We're rather interested in the white grape pomace, which is what is left behind in the press after we pressed all the juice up. Um, um, but now we've got this white grape pumice. Uh, there isn't any alcohol here at all, uh, but there is still quite a lot of sugar that is stuck to those skins. And so what we're going to need to do, that need to dilute that slightly with some water, add some yeast, and we'll let that ferment for a bit. And that alcoholic liquid we can then distill to create a grappa. All right. The other way that we can make uh, uh, pumice 
uh, or make grappa is we will use black grape pomace. And for this, we, the, uh, the way that it works is slightly different. Uh, we would take our black grapes, crush them, um, and for, with that, we've got our grape juice and the skins, and they'll all go together into a fermenter where we'll add yeast. And that uh, yeast uh, will get things going. And this is how we make red wine, essentially. Once that fermentation is finished and we're ready to move on to our next step, that whole piece is put into a press um, and the liquid is drained off. And that liquid is obviously our red wine. Once again, we are not so interested in the red wine for this process, but in the black grape pomace uh, that we have uh, left over. Now, unlike the white grape pomace where we needed to go through a fermentation, we don't actually need to do that with the black grape pomace because, well, there's already, it's already been through a fermentation and there's quite a lot of alcohol that's actually still attached to that pomace. And so what we want to do is we want to access that. So we're going to put it in a still and we are going to distill it and we will be able to get our grappa from there. Right, but this sounds a little bit more complicated than that. And the reason is because if you think about what that pomace looks like, it's a solid, it's not a liquid. So how do you go about distilling it? So we start off with um, a very, very specialist type of still. Picture I've got up here actually shows a, a pot still or batch still um, that is specifically designed for uh, distilling pomace. Uh, we also, there also are column stills that exist for this purpose, but they work uh, operate on a similar sort of principle. Essentially, the pomace is placed into baskets. So these big uh, metal or wooden baskets that are perforated, and that will hold the pomace. You'll notice that there's lots of different baskets. It's not just one. And the reason is because if there's too much in there, it'll just squash the pomace below it. And so it will be compressed and we won't be able to uh, get enough um, heat uh, uh, and steam off of that pomace. What's then, what then happens is we inject steam into the base of the still, and that steam is going to pass through uh, all of these pomace baskets. Now, the alcohol that's sitting on the outside of the grape skins and the stalks and things is going to um, is going to evaporate. It's more volatile than the other components, and so that will concentrate uh, in the vapor uh, that comes out of the other side. That's then further rectified, um, so it's it's either distilled again or it is um, placed in a, um, in a column or it is placed in a, um, a condenser. And that final product will be grappa. Seeing we've got quite a lot of questions on the, uh, on the chat. I'm just seeing if there's anything here. Lots of people all over the world. Welcome. Lovely to see you all. Okay. Right, so if we just talk a little bit about the types of grappa that we might get at the end, um, we can have um, uh, polyvitinia. So a uh, multi-variety grappa. These are probably the most common grappas in, uh, and they tend to be based in areas 
uh, where there are already there's already winemaking happening, and the the grapes that will are used will tend to be the grapes of that region. So if we think about uh, grappa made in uh, prosecco, then you know that will be some of the, the those will be the grapes that are used in that particular part of part of Italy. Um, we also could get a mono vitigno, so a single variety um, variety grape, in which case the that that uh, grappa will be labeled with that that grape, and we'll get the aromas of that grape. Tend to be very very aromatic uh, styles of grappa. So moscato is the most common one, uh, and moscato is tastes very grapey, um, if that makes sense. So fresh grape juice kind of aromas. Another one's Gewurz Tremina. It's very, very floral, and sort of rose-like aromas. Uh, you could also have two varieties, so a blend. If uh, there is a label, if, if the varieties are on the label, um, they, they can only be a maximum of two of them, and they must account for it. 85% of the pomace used. Um, if it's a blend, if there's any less than that, you can't actually put the uh, put the grapes on the label. I see we've got some key questions coming through. Okay, so uh, Michaela asks the question, any pomace, white or red, is going through only one distillation to obtain grappa? The answer to that is, it depends. Um, but usually there would be a second distillation as well. But yes, you could technically do it in one uh, in one distillation. Well, let's see what else have we got here. Uh, there's a, a question from Alan. Uh, does grappa have specific leg legal re regulation in order to legally call it grappa? Yes, uh, there are loads and loads of rules. Uh, the most important thing, though, is that it needs to be made in Italy. Um, that, so in order for it to be grappa. Um, but yes, there are loads and loads of, of regulations. And there are different labeling terms that we have um, in, 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 in grappa. Yeah. Uh, there's another question here from Letty. Do the baskets used for distillation add aromas to the grappa? Uh, no, Letty, they don't. Uh, they are generally uh, they, they're inert. Um, so even if they are made from wood, they tend to be very, very old wood. And so there any aromas on that would have long gone. Uh, but most of the modern stills, those baskets would be made out of stainless steel. Uh, Michaela, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm realized I'm answering these all in the in different uh, in different orders. Is any uh, Kevin asks is anything else added during the distillation process? Think of herbs, etc., that are used to make gin. Uh, very, very good question, Kevin. Uh, no, uh, not during distillation. Uh, though we might we do actually get flavored grappa, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, where those herbs or spices or fruit can be added to, to uh, grappa, and it's often left in the bottle as well. Um, Pratham asks a question. If I had never had grappa before, is there any difference between grappa and grappa di prosecco? Uh, well, grappa di prosecco is a type of grappa. Uh, it just made with a Prosecco grape. Um, and so they are both grappas. The grappa di Prosecco will be made with a Prosecco grape. That's all that is the difference. And uh, Michaela uh, asks if grappa is made only in the two provinces of origin. Uh, no, it's made all over Italy. 
and it can be regulated under the DOC or DOCG rules as well. Um, so yeah, um, there are a huge variety of different things. I'm going to move on to the next slide, and uh, maybe some of the those questions will be asked uh, answered. So the vast majority of grappa is actually unaged, um, or it uh, and and so if it's unaged, it will be clear, uh, it will be very aromatic, um, and it might be quite harsh in texture if it's completely unaged. Better examples tend to be rested. So they are aged, but not in oak. They're just aged in inert vessels like stainless steel or something like that for a period of several months. And what that will do is it doesn't actually change the aromas so much as the textures. So the textures will round out uh, and it will become uh, a, a lot uh, sort of smoother in the palate um, and less angular in in how it how how it feels inside your mouth uh, and so that is well but we'll still have those sort of fresh aromas aromas of pomace so particularly herbal sort of stalky aroma but also of uh, whatever grape variety we happen to be using and so if you are familiar with the wine that's quite a useful way to think about what that grappa might taste like. So if we have a muscat, for example, if you've ever tasted muscat wine or uh, muscato, uh, those aromas that you get in the wine, you will also find in the, in, in the grappa because distillation is actually going to select and concentrate those aromas and make them all even more um, obvious. Some, a small amount of grappa, actually very little in the, the scheme of the grappa industry, is barrel aged. And there are um, sort of regulations about what, how, to, how those can be uh, labeled. Um, and so uh, you could have something that's either been aged for a minimum of 12 months or 18 months in oak. And those grappas will not be clear in color anymore, but will be anything from sort of pale lemon in color all the way up to sort of a pale amber in color. And that oak, those barrels, um, which are not necessarily oak either, they could be chestnut as well, uh, will give some uh, aroma to, to, the, uh, to the grappa as well. Um, it'll also change the texture some more. Remember what we said a little earlier about resting in inert vessels? Well, the same thing is going to happen in a barrel. All of that texture is going to change. It's going to round out those edges quite a lot. Some of the brighter, uh, more volatile kind of aromas of those sort of um, those grapey aromas or the, the herbal aromas might be slightly suppressed, but you will get some other aromas of sort of tobacco uh, for example, uh, and that lovely texture. Um, and just like I promised before, we were talking about those uh, flavored grappa, so grappa uh, aromatizata. Uh, please excuse my pronunciation. Italian is definitely not my first language. Uh, we uh, would be adding uh, aromatics to the grappa. And this is, again, it's not a huge volume of this is produced, uh, but it's, it can be very, very nice. And it can be herbs, for example. Uh, often some of the herbs that are associated with uh, aromatized wines are used in grappa production as well. So in, in this particular uh, style, but it could be um, also uh, spices and fruits as well. Okay, let's see, I think we've got some more questions coming through. Uh, so I've got a question here saying, if the, produ if the produce from Italy can only be called grappa, are there any grappa-like produced outside of Italy and what are they called? Yeah, um, absolutely. Pomace uh, spirits are produced all over the world. Uh, for example, in France, they produce a... Uh, a spirit called Mark, 
uh, which is um, also a pomace brandy, but uh, they actually make something similar all over the world, but none of it can be called grappa. Um, and the, the thing is that is quite interesting about grappa is that Italy has an enormous number of different grapes that are only in Italy. And so uh, grappa will have uh, a character that is based on the raw materials that are only available there. Yeah. Um, the, I've got a question from Jonathan. Um, that is, how do you tell a, a well-made grappa from a not so well, well-made grappa? Uh, and it's a very, very good question. Um, a lot of it is going to do with aroma. So the way we think about it is we think about the balance to start with. So when uh, are the aromas balanced or does it feel like one particular element is sticking out and uh, it's sort of one dimensional or is there some complexity there as well? The other thing that we're interested in is that sort of textural balance. So when you, when you taste it, does it coat the whole of your mouth? Or does it feel like, oh, it's just sitting on the sides. What shape is it in your mouth? Is it round or is it sort of spiky? Um, those are some of the, the ways that we can, we can judge, judge the quality of the grappa, just like we would any other spirit. Um, another thing that we might think about is the length and complexity. So how long does the, do the aromas stay on your palate and are they pleasant? Um, if it just tastes like jet fuel and all I can taste for an hour is jet fuel, that is not a long and complex finish. That's a, a disappointing one. Um, so it, a lot of it comes down to pleasure. Um, Oliver asks, to achieve a final alcohol content uh, of 40%, will it be blended with water? Yes, so that is a very good question. So as a producer, as a distiller, uh, the distiller has got quite a few choices that they can make. They can distill to a lower level, and that's going to give us a lot of uh, intensity of aroma. And our best grappers will be distilled to a lower level. And so they'll still need to probably, uh, they, they will still need to uh, dilute them, uh, but uh, probably less. A sort of very, very large production type grappa, which maybe aren't so aromatic, aren't so strongly flavored. Those are going to be distilled to a higher level, and you'll be able to, they'll be able to dilute them further. Uh, Aroit, a uh, number of years, grappa is aged. Uh, if it's barrel aged or rested. Uh, yeah, it's a really, really good question. I mean, I'm sure there are grappas that have been aged for a very, very, very long time indeed, but I would say that that is quite unusual. Most grappa that is aged is going to be aged uh, probably under two years or so. And the reason I say that is just because uh, the aromas of the, the grappa is all about the aromas of that pomace and those the, 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 the grape variety. And if you age it for too long in an oak barrel, that aroma will get lost. It's disguised by the aroma of the barrel itself. So although they are being aged, uh, the, that, uh, that aroma, that uh, difference, um, it, it's about getting that balance right. Does barrel aging change its color as well? Uh, yes, it does. Um, let's say it could be anything from sort of a pale lemon, which is a sort of yellowy color, all the way up to sort of a pale amber color. Um, and if, if, if it's been barrel aged, sometimes some producers will also color their, their, uh, their grappa slightly uh, with a, um, a caramel coloring uh, in the same way that uh, um, a lot of spirit producers do. Um, and the only grappa that is allowed to be colored is actually aged grappa as well. Um, Hassan asks, any idea why it's called grappa? 
does the term stand for distilled pumice? To be honest with you, Hassan, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, but yet yeah, grappa does have a meaning that is legally defined and that does need to be made with pumice and it does need to come from Italy. Uh, what are the tasting differences between grappa and rakia? Johnny asks. Uh, they are quite different. Um, they have some similarities, but rakia quite regularly is, um, is actually uh, flavored. Okay, um, and so it's much more likely to be flavored than grappa is. Ehela asks, what are the similarities or big differences between grappa and say cognac or armagnac? So referring to the process and not the taste characteristics. I think that well, that's a really good question. So if we think about cognac or armagnac, or in fact, any brandy or grape brandy, uh, uh, brandy. The big difference is that we are; those are distilled from wine, uh, whereas in this case with grappa, we are actually the raw material is not wine, but rather is uh, pumice. So a lot of the aroma is going to be coming from the uh, skins and the stalks uh, and those particular aromas, rather than the juice. And that is going to make a huge difference in terms of uh, the aromas. Uh, also, the other thing with these, with sort of um, cognac and armagnac, is a lot of the aroma and flavor is actually also coming from um, everything being aged in oak for long periods of time. Whereas with grappa, that's less of an emphasis. Okay. Um, uh, something has just popped up here. There's a poll. Uh, you're welcome to please, please feed it, fill in the feedback poll. I'll stick around and answer some more questions, uh, but please let us know how the webinar went. Right. Anna asked the question, does grappa undergo any changes when aged in bottles? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, in the main, no but we've just talked about resting in inert vessels. So there might be some sort of textural changes in an unopened bottle over a period of time, but in reality, the flavors or the aromas won't change very much. Uh, Jajaneski says, is grappa considered a digestive or more like an appetite? To be honest with you, uh, it depends on you. Um, quite uh, commonly, this is used as a digestive, um, but uh, depending on where you are, some people will have it with a bit of, um, I think somebody mentioned in the comments, uh, an espresso, and uh, they'll have some grappa on the side, and you finish your espresso, and you pour the rest of your grappa in to the espresso cup, and you drink that. Um, Please don't do that with the very best quality of grappa because it will just taste like coffee. It's delicious, but uh, the best grappa tastes of the pumice, and that's what you really want to taste. Uh, John asks, could you address the medicinal qualities of grappa that Italians have drunk it for centuries? For example, stomach issues. Um, John, I, if I could, I would. <laughs> I don't know. I think. It's one of these things that, it, that, you know, a lot of these digestives have been associated with medicine. Uh, just something to be, I, I don't know what the scientific evidence of that is. Um, something to be aware of though, is it is full of alcohol. And so um, drinking it for medical purposes uh, might be quite a good excuse rather than uh, actually uh, of medical benefit. But I couldn't, I couldn't comment on, on the veracity of those claims. Um, Letty asks, what makes the grappa's texture round in the mouth when aging in inert vessels? Oh, Letty, we just do not have time for, that is a, an enormously complex question. <laughs> um, and to be honest, it's, it, it's, it, it's one for a, a, a chemist. Um, I, I couldn't tell you the actual uh, chemical 
reason. Uh, but I do know that what tends to happen is that um, the most volatile components uh, tend to disappear or be dissolved uh, with other components within the mixture. And that seems to change the texture. But in terms of anything further than that, I couldn't give you any more uh, information. Uh, Katham Patil asks, what kind of food can we pair with grappa? Well, lots and lots of different things. It would depend on the grappa to a certain extent. Uh, we've mentioned sort of coffee, um, and it works quite well with um, desserts. I've seen it paired with um, things like, um, not some, what, what do they call it? Um, uh, like a um, fresh fruit uh, uh, glacé, you know? Uh, I'm trying to think what the, what the word is, like an ice cream, but made with fruit juice, uh, like a granita or something like that can be very, very nice. Uh, but I've see, also seen it served with quite oily fish um, uh, uh, sort of mackerel uh, as, a, as a sort of aperitif for the snack. But whatever you like, or all, all by, by itself. Uh, right. Hassan asks, what's the best way to serve grappa? Temperature, glassware, ice? Um, a very good question again. Um, I would generally serve it slightly chilled. I generally don't serve it with ice, but there is no rule about that. So normally we'd serve it uh, slightly chilled, particularly for uh, the styles that are not aged. If something's been aged in, in oak, we might serve it slightly warmer. So just below room temperature would be fine. Jonathan asks, what glass should we use? Uh, we can use a, uh, a, a basically an ISO glass or just a small, um, something similar to a sherry glass, essentially. Ah, Simone has answered our question, where does the term grappa come from? So she says it helps, it comes from graspo, which is the Italian term for grape stalk. Thank you so much, Simone. That is really, really helpful. I've learned something there. All right. Uh, yeah. Um, I think we are at the end of our time limit, to be honest with you. So I'd like to say thank you so, so much. Uh, for your for your time and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again sometime soon. Thank you so much.